Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I'm Luisa. I am the coordinator of Rede Brasil. And today it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to our scientific writing workshop in partnership with the Sustainable Science Institute. So we're going to have a, a start on our webinar today, which is going until Friday. So welcome everyone. And it's my great pleasure as well to introduce our speakers and tutors that will be with you during this whole, um, during this whole session. And so today we'll have um, Maria Elena, who is the scientific director of the Sustainable Science Institute based in San Francisco, California, as well as uh, Antonio Gregorio Diaz Jr., who is a postdoctoral scholar in the Division of Infectious Diseases and Vaccinology at the School of Public Health um, of the University of California, Berkeley. And also Stephen Popper, who is a visiting scholar in the Division of Infectious Diseases and Vaccinology at the School of Public Health um, of the University of California, Berkeley as well. So now we'll just go to a few housekeeping notes for you all to, to be aware of how this is going to be organized. So this workshop is being recorded and you will be able to see the, the videos in a few weeks in our YouTube channel. Also, all the videos and microphones of all of the participants have been disabled, as well as another important thing, which is the chat box. So please use the chat box to introduce yourself and post any comments. And for those of you who haven't used Zoom before, please make sure you select all panelists and attendees when you are uh, writing something to all of us. Um, for questions, please use the Q&A box. So it's down here at this black uh, bar at the bottom of your screen. So use the Q&A box to submit your questions and we will be able to uh, answer them at the Q&A um, time. So we just to note that we welcome questions in both English and Portuguese. So feel free to use either language. Also, um, please note that the link used to get in today is the same link that you will be using for Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday as well. So just keep the same link. And for the 20 people who were selected to be full participants, uh, we will send you another link that you should use for the tutorial sessions in the afternoon. We'll send that during the, the lunch break. So this is all from me, and I'm going now um, to pass on to Maria Elena so she can um, start this amazing uh, workshop. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Good morning, um, everyone. I'm very happy to um, be part of this amazing effort that um, has been organized by Bonnie and Luisa from the ready uh, our website. I could present my institute. So I am the scientific director of Sustainable Sciences Institute, like Luisa said. And um, we've been doing this for a long time, uh, since, then, since year 2000. I just want to tell you a few words about what we do. Uh, scientific Science Institute, Sustainable Science Institute, um, mission is to provide support to um, to us people from Latin America, I'm originally from Costa Rica, to write and uh, do our research and write our own, our own results because our countries in the developing world have a little, being a little behind from the countries in the north and we want to promote um, writing, doing proposal writing and manuscript writing and many other workshops that we've been offering for 20 years. And we have shown that people that do our workshop kind of uh, do better proposals and get to publish a higher rate on the manuscripts. So I'm gonna give you a, diff a general talk on manuscript writing. You are probably gonna know many of these uh, points but I will, it's just a refresher for some, is make sure to cover and have all the, all the items necessary for a manuscript to publish. And then a few pointers on how to publish better and how to 
um, um, get successful uh, scientific publications. So um, that's all I wanted to say. It's a little of a shame I cannot see you, but um, maybe the in the afternoon we'll get to know the 20 participants that are interacting. Um, so getting it started. This is gonna be an interactive workshop where um, you are going to, uh, we're going to teach the basics of scientific writing and help you progress on your current manuscript. This will be for the afternoon sessions with the 20 people that are actually writing with us. But if in the general audience, um, you have data and you're gonna start writing, um, it is, will be helpful for you to do the exercise that we were gonna present in the second talk and start organizing yourself. And that, well, that way you will take most advantage of this workshop because we're gonna teach in the mornings a few uh, lectures and we are gonna be writing in the afternoons and at night and whatever. And we're gonna be reviewing, not for the general public, but um, for the 20, but the, the, the rest of you could uh, do your own exercises on your own. And so the format, it will be lectures and exercises followed by one-on-one -on -one tutor tutoring to help write your manuscript. Um, next. So why publish? Why is this all this, um, you know, exercise we do um, because this is how we build the body of knowledge and the science. If people wouldn't publish, we wouldn't know what's going on around the world and all the advances, multiple advances that have been happening. So it, it, it helps dissemination, new information that um, new scientists are um, discovering day by day and we will disseminate our own. And that's what's important that we, that um, we don't only have to read and do little research. We have to also disseminate our new information and new findings to be part of the scientific community and establish you as a member of the research community and allows feedback. So not only you publish uh, your findings, but you will, um, Initiate for saying, you know, um, a feedback, a discussion uh, of the new data that was published. Is this data valid? Is this data similar to what I found? Is this data different to what I found? And it's part of how the scientific body is built by, by sharing our data, by sharing our work. So scientific knowledge is constructed in just, <clears throat> I'm sorry, um, just in layer of, uh, bricks just in working in the lab and fields, but in arguments that scientists conduct through the medium of scientific papers. Uh, this is where we discuss in the discussion of our articles, what it is that we are, uh, our new findings and what does it mean for the rest of the, the scientific community. So the goals of writing and, uh, sorry, I just have, cannot see my, uh, the goal of scientific research is to further, further scientific knowledge. It can be achieve, achieved unless you describe to others. So that's one of our main points that even though we do, we manage to do research, we manage to have new findings, we lack on the publishing of those findings because publishing takes a special effort and it is time consuming and it is not easy. So, but not until you publish what you have achieved you haven't finished your research, that's the idea. So the primary aim is to communicate and you need to convince your readers of why your research is important. So we're not only just um, publishing, writing down our results and publishing it, we have to make it important. We have to make it relevant. We have to convince first the editors and then the, the, the readers of why our research is important. We have to have a, a little bit as midget of new information or new uh, way of describing something, new methodology that we're communicating and 
we, in the introduction, we convince them why this is important. And that's the justification of, of our work. We're gonna talk about the parts of each um, part before or later. So, our, uh, so it has to be original, that's very important. New information, you cannot publish uh, information that has been shared, although it's okay if you share it on a Congress or on a meeting, but it has not been published. So original research, um, there will be a hypothesis of, of interventions that um, some papers are, are gonna be doing, descriptive and surveillance articles, which I've seen some of the people that uh, pro, um, submitted their summaries. Um, new methods of procedures that are gonna be described, case series and meta-analysis that I also saw case, uh, a case control work in the one presented. Case reports is also some. And there are the meta-analysis also consider literature reviews when you are um, reviewing uh, all there is in the literature and publishing it as an article. So all have a solid structure and, a, and they need a main point. And we're gonna talk about a main point quite often. Um, so an article format, as most of you know, has an introduction, material and methods, results, discussion and abstract. That's basically the sections of a scientific article. Um, and this is a little sketch we made, which is like a wrapper of a candy, of a sweet, um, where this is the wrapper and uh, the introduction. The introduction is the why we did it. We have to motivate the reader. This is, this is gonna, our justification will be part of it. And why is it in an uh, inverted pyramid? Because the introduction, we start a general, introducing the topic. And then we next talk about what uh, is known in the literature. Then we, we explain why, based on what is known or not known, we're gonna do, we're gonna do our work. Uh, and we propose our work and how we're gonna do it at the end. Many people nowadays, since uh, there is so much published and we have little room, um, little time to read as well, talk about their results. So in a, in a scientific article, you don't hide your results. Your results are how you start and how you finish. You, you repeat them and you, you tell the audience what is what's new, what is uh, your novelty that you're publishing. Methodology is how you did it, and it has to be detailed because it's going to enable replication of your work. Results is the meat, is the candy itself inside the wrapper. And what did you find out? What was your finding? And you're going to share your data. So this is the most, um, that's the longer part of the, uh, of the article. And it's, it's important because that's where it's based. The introduction and the discussion is going to be based on results as well as on the methodology you use. And the discussion, it's um, a pyramid that start with your main point again, your main finding, and then you discuss it in what has been found by others. And then um, you, you can cite others, but this is when you give your opinion, you suggest interpretation. So the discussion is the significance what uh, what is all mean what we did for all this for and the interpretation you can suggest it so right before the, the discussion all these other parts are objective and just following a methodology and the discussion is when you can suggest your interpretation is the only place in which you can express your own opinion and then you have acknowledges who help give thanks and the references of course and all these we're going to talk about each uh, of the parts of this, um, <clears throat> this list of parts of the article. So, um, so this allows you to, <clears throat> sorry, I, um, the top of my article is, um, Well, state, what, it, what is this art writing article will allow you to do? State your assumptions and the main point in multiple places. 
in the abstract, in the introduction, in the results, and in the discussion. You repeat what's important. That's another of the points we're trying to do. You don't finish your research until you publish it and you repeat what you, your findings are in all the, um, almost all the sections of an article. You describe your essays to others so that they can repeat the experiment, material and methods, and you clearly se separate interpretation in the discussions with data in the results. So when you're presenting your data, you cannot say, oh, I think this means, or oh, our interpretation of the results, or this leads us to think that this is valid or this is, no. You can suggest in the result, but you cannot discuss and say what you think. You can just state your findings. So science writing is different than literature writing, very different. It's very short, direct, and in sentences are used simple. Clarity is the most important factor in making sure your message is communicated and understood. An appropriate language is critical to communicate your specific meaning. This is easy to say, and it's a little harder to achieve because we've been taught to write um, those that don't have much experience in writing scientific articles, uh, we're taught to write in the school um, with long sentences describing in detail, or we propose to do this because therefore, and in science, it's like we did, we found this and the other, we, it has to be clear and short. And almost as a telegram, not quite, because you know you have to link your sentences, but um, it doesn't have any extra words. You don't want the reader to get lost. Um, and you have to have clear language as well. In this case, we're all publishing in English because it's um, the language where most countries or science, most science is expressed. So that's why we uh, emphasize publishing in, uh, in English um, and learn to, to write in English, it will be very beneficial for us in the future and in, in the science field. So when do you start writing? Uh, when do you have enough data for a, an article or a paper? Analyze the data and prepare the figures. And first, um, do tell a story. Try writing an outline, a rough draft. This might expose holes or um, in your data or data that is not completely um, complete. It doesn't have the right controls or it needs more uh, this or that. We forgot this section. We should have done more on this. It's not clear to us um, what, what's going on. So, um, Tell a story, write a rough outline, and see what it comes. See if you have um, if you have all that's necessary to to write an article. Not too much information and not too little. So we're gonna go in the second talk talk about the tree of ideas, which is um, how you organize your ideas. I, I know some of you already have uh, do have done it, but have written an article almost. But the tree of ideas support you through, through the whole article. It kind of organizes you and that's what you're based on it. Um, and then uh, <clears throat> summarize, um, are your samples meaningful? This is it, are there you have confidence intervals when you're doing statistical analysis. Data uh, reaches a statistical significance. So all these things we're gonna, uh, we're gonna do um, generally think and write before we really start writing our article. So you create a rough draft or an abstract, start with your tables and figures. What data will you present and how? So how, what would be best? A figure, a chart, a table. Decide what not to show as well as what to show. This is important. Uh, we have to show our controls and we have to show um, our main findings. And then many, many times we find extra findings that take us in a different direction. It might be in the beginning of a new article or a new paper we're gonna write. So select your data that tells a story. 
write a sentence or a phrase about each table and figure, uh, and what do they show? If these sentences tell a story, then you are ready. So you take your data and you say, okay, this data could be on a chart, this, or you can do tables and see what you have, and then maybe decide this table will be better on a figure. We, we have a section on, on figures and tables. And then you take usually three main findings and then they are coherent and I make a story that it's worth to publish and we go ahead and receive feedback, present your work orally, formally or informally to others uh, after you write, um, receive suggestions of others, that's very helpful. Um, don't be afraid to show your da data and discuss with your colleagues. Um, so then we're gonna be <clears throat> mainly uh, talking about the main point several times or so global message. Uh, what is the most important finding that you want the reader to know? What is the new piece of information that, that you, um, you can subtract from all the work you do, you did? Which aspect you consider is the main finding or interest to be published and the reader deserves to know? This is your main point or your global message and you repeat it again and again. So many times we have different results but we have a unifying subject. We have a unifying topic, a theme that we, um, that we found with all our experiments. And we have to find out what it is the most important thing. What is the point that's new? What, because an article has to be original and has to have new novel uh, information. So what is this midget of part of our, all our findings on our work, which is valid? That's the most important message that we go at the end. That's your main point. And that's what you bring up at the beginning in the title and in the introduction in the, um, in the discussion as well and in the results. Uh, so the global message or main point, we're gonna be in the title. We don't hide our results as a different uh, way of writing. Like when we write a novel that, you know, who did it and, you know, it's a mystery until the end. This is exactly the opposite. We don't want to hide our results. We bring it up and we say, this is what we found. Um, read my article, you know, and the editors and the journals are gonna pick it because, and choose your article because um, your main point is in the title if possible. In the introduction, of course, you are gonna end the introduction saying this is our main objective or our work. Uh, because we had just shown what the literature has or not has. We had just explained what is that we tried to do at the end of the introduction. And then we say our findings or most important findings or what we want, want to clarify or find is this and that. Material methods, not, they don't have the main point. They are just stated objectively and results have the main point, of course, the results. The discussion you start, um, talking about the main point. That's how you, I was telling you. The introduction is an inver inverted pyramid and the discussion is an upright pyramid and they both end or start with your main point. And in the abstract, of course, the main point. So repetition in science is key. It's not, again, like a novel or other things we've written. In a scientific article, you don't have the time, many of us, if we're honest, we read the title, we read the abstract, we see the figures, and then we, we read a little bit of the discussion. Uh, so that's why it has to be repeated because um, very seldom, unless we're very interested in repeating the, the, the work that we're reading, when we publish, uh, we have to re repeat several times what we want the reader to keep from our, work, what is the main findings we want them to take home. And we know that the reader is not going to read, read the whole article uh, from beginning to end. Uh, there are many articles we have to read and um, we just glance at different, different parts of it real quickly. So um, who, to, who should be author? That's something that has to be done at the beginning. Oh my God. Um, before writing the article, 
and it is important to decide the uh, order of the authors. It's, it's, it, it causes a lot of headache and a lot of confusion and a lot of disappointing. And that's why I'm talking about it now. When we start, when we made that first draft of the data we have, we have had many collaborators. We work on a team, different people did different things. Who is gonna be part of the article? It, that is decided before you write it so people know what section or part they can help you with. with. They're gonna help you with figures, with discussion. They are part of the work. So who are the, the authors that go on an article, those who contributed substantial, substantially to the work by doing all three following um, parts. So substantial contribution in the conception and design, in the acquisition of data, or in the analysis and the interpretation of data. So be a person that's at work on it in some, in some form, in some area. Drafting the article and revising it critically for important intellectual con content. It's going to be part of writing the article or revising it critically to see if it all makes sense. And final approval of the revision to be published. So deciding who is an author might depend on the rules and the institutional lab or the journal. So that is kind of depends on the journal too because they have started limiting the amount of um, authors or co-authors you can have. The main author is usually the person that did the most work. Uh, and then we have five, six collaborations, but their publications in nature sometimes had up to 20, 25. They started limiting that amount of co-authors you can have. Um, and now they're asking, requesting for a letter uh, saying from each co-author what part of the section they uh, they did. So once you decide who should be an author or in your team they decide, you, you talk to each of them and agree that they should be willing to make public a responsibility of the work. They are responsible as you are. Have the review, review the field, field draft, final draft. And as I was saying, many journalists ask for details on how each author contributed and the confirmation of what each author did. So this was introduced because many times um, the head of the department, super head high up requests that his name be in all the articles. And this person sometimes doesn't know exactly what you did. And that presents a big uh, problem. So you have to deal, that's actually left for each department in each institution. You decide if um, who is going to be part, what are the, the rules in your, in your department and in your team. Uh, and these are just general uh, kind of advice that we give and which are the regulations that people are requesting uh, these days. So in order of importance of the experience and work that we contribute is the authors. Uh, the first author is the primary author, did most of the experiments and the writing. This uh, first author sometimes um, in a laboratory which I work at Berkeley, two postdocs, two, two participants, two researchers have done equal amount of work. They say one did the molecular biology part, the other one did the immunology part. They are both very capable and they can be first co-authors. So it is a, a footnote in the article that says, um, John Smith and Juan Castro are both first authors. Um, and that's, that is accepted. But generally uh, there's a one person that writes the article and that one person that lead the, the, the research, that's the person that should be first author. Did most of the experiments and did the writing. And the last author is typically the head of the laboratory uh, that has been involved, you know, so the head of the team, the head of the department, the head of the laboratory that helped us come with the idea, helped us with interpreting data and it's, um, knowledgeable of all the aspects of the article that we wrote. 
that can defend it. When I was a, my postdoc at Bur Baylor College in Houston, my boss at the time uh, came to the office and there were students waiting for her because she was a co-author in this article and there was a part they didn't understand. And she didn't know she was co-author because a colleague of hers in another institution used to put her in because they shared uh, the samples. And she didn't know this had been published. She didn't, she couldn't explain the table that the, the questions the students have. And it, you know, I, I had to live it, you know, and how um, stressful that was and how inappropriate that was. So you have to have your uh, co-authors um, well advised and in agreement on which section each is gonna write and the order they're gonna go. Uh, although this varies, as I say, from institution to institution. If you have too many collaborators that you would like to put uh, as co-authors, think about just uh, give thanks at the end. There's a section in our articles and we're gonna review that in a few days. Well, this person helped a little, but it doesn't really can defend the whole article. So you acknowledge and the we acknowledge the excellent work of Maria <clears throat> Smith for the uh, for collecting data or for sharing um, reagents. Many times, if people will share reagents, will share data, uh, um, data or uh, other things, we'll put them as co-authors, and that's pretty much not accepted these days. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about writing style now. Scientific writing is different from other writing. The language used in science writing is more direct and short, like I was, I was saying, and make it easy to follow. Present a direct story that supports your main point. Again, in the second talk, we're gonna um, focus this more on how we talk about our main points and sub points. So show your line of thinking um, and help the reader understand your thought process. That's what we're trying to say when you say clearly and logically and that follows easy. We start from the beginning, hopefully, or oh, this is what we did first. And then with this, for these other results, we did second and then with the third, um, these are our findings and you present your methods, material methods usually as you present the results in the same order and you discuss them in the same order. So it has to be simple and easy to follow. That's, uh, that's what we're trying to say. So we are gonna talk about the paragraph structure. Think about the paragraph structure, place emphasis in deliberate points uh, link ideas into logical sequence with transitions and be concise. So a uh, paragraph has a structure that we have to... So we're gonna talk a little bit about paragraph um, and about a paragraph structure. Each paragraph is a new thought and should have a main point. So um, one thought per paragraph. Let's not mix thoughts in the same paragraph. So you write sentences within the paragraph that be to be connected by ob an obvious flow of ideas. We're gonna explain this a little bit more. So you begin the topic with a sentence that is a short and clear introduction. So in, we found this particular finding, you know, that, um, Obesity contributes to um, breast cancer. Um, and we did this by, by the findings expressed in table one or figure two that illustrates this particular point. And we don't repeat what is in the table two. We just say, what's the main um, finding? what is the trend that this figure or, or chart is, is, is showing. Um, and then you end by restating the main point. So in a few words, the transition to the next paragraph or begin with the next paragraph with a transitional phase, then continue. So um, 
we're going to have to practice to do this. And I think I have an example, a paragraph example. So we start. The key characteristic of scientific writing is clarity. Ideally, clarity should be the, a characteristic of any type of communication. So we introduced the, our, the paragraph saying, the key characteristic of writing is clarity. And we're gonna be re repeating that little word clarity. It depends, it, it, independently of what was your finding, you, you know that uh, we found that obesity is linked to breast cancer. Uh, then we say, because we found this and that and the other. So ideally clarity should be a characteristic of any time, type of communication. However, when something is being said for the first time, clarity is essential. Most scientific papers, those published in our primary research journals are accepted for publication precisely because they do contribute to new knowledge, which is very important. Hence, we should demand absolute clarity in science writing. So see, we started saying the key characteristic of scientific writing is clarity and we ended up saying the same. We should demand absolute clarity in scientific writing. And in the middle of the paragraph, we explain what main finding took us to uh, decide that clarity was important you know, because it's uh, more scientific papers, they are published when they're clear, if not, they are rejected um, and so on and so forth. So we explain our finding here, but our main point here, and it's repeated because ideally clarity, we don't, we don't say ideally it should be, a, should be a characteristic of any time of communication because we don't know, we lose our thought, our train of thought. Like I was saying, people just read um, quick, quickly. They read the beginning of the paragraph and the end of the paragraph, but then we, we repeat that little word or that little finding all through the paragraph to, um, to guide the reader and help him out to find or her um, what is the important section. So in the style, um, emphasize the important information and repeat it. And I'm repeating myself, <laughs> repeating this. So uh, it's a loop. So emphasize, emphasize the important information, repeat it. Highlight the most important finding that was in, in our experiments, uh, in our studies. And for less important information, make it shorter and you don't repeat it. So you have your controls, you have other small uh, findings that support the main finding, but they are not as important. Um, there is many findings that we have when, when we do an article and we know which ones are important. There's usually three important messages at least that we have. And those are the ones that we repeat, but we do not repeat information that is um, not as essential. So we mentioned it once, but we don't keep talking about it um, <clears throat> through all the article. Uh, so emphasis in, in, in power positions, again, another example for you to have. First and last sentence of a paragraph are power positions. Middle sentences often are buried. Readers tend to be less conscious of the, what the middle is saying, and they may be in a hurry and will consciously or unconsciously just read the first and last sentence of a paragraph. So use those stress positions to your advantage. Again, this is just an example. This is the first sentence that says, use power positions. Why is important to use power positions and use those stress positions to your advantage. So, okay, that's how you construct a paragraph with your data. These are just very general examples. Um, so emphasis in keywords, repeat the keywords to make your message clear so that the reader will remember them. There is abundant evidence for the public health benefits of bed net use. This is in a study that was doing um, prevention of malaria. These benefits, and you repeat, include the following, low cost, easy to use, and can be used with insecticides impregnating the nets. Well, whatever, I just know that article. But um, 
there is abundant evidence for the public health benefits of use of bed net. Okay, we're clear there. If we continue, if we're continuing, they are low cost, easy to use. <clears throat> we lose the reader. So we said these benefits, we repeat what we're talking about to make it more clear. Like in the example of clarity, to make it more clear, we repeat these benefits include following low cost, easy use. Don't be afraid of repeating in, a, in the next sentence what specifically you are talking about. The reader will not notice repetition as much as you do because they are just trying to understand what you're saying. And it will be helpful for them um, to see a paragraph like this. And then, for example, uh, this is a silly uh, example. Digitalis increases the contractability of mammalian heart. Changes in the calcium influx through the muscle cell membrane cause this increase in contract. It's not as clear, but you can kind of gather. But we would like better say this. Digitalis increases contractibility of the mammalian heart. Muy bien. Very good. This increase contractibility results from the changes of calcium influx to the muscle. The context is not important. The important is to say that the, this particular factor increases contractibility of the heart. This increase is due to what? So we repeat, like when we repeat the benefits of the bed nets, we repeat the contents of what? The sentence of the word that we want the person to remember. And they will not forget if they read it like this. Um, so we have to connect the ideas. Each paragraph represents one thought of idea. It should be clear how, <clears throat> how each new thought follows from the previous one. So show your line of thoughts. So we're gonna have um, ideas, uh, words that connect. So we, uh, it's, uh, it's nice to have some headings if allow for the journal uh, <clears throat> to introduce each topic, um, the part of molecular biology, the part of immunology, the epidemiology we did, or what findings are we going to, Fine, and then we have transition words and phrases that allow us to uh, move to the new paragraph. Therefore, we did this, or therefore we did this other experiment. Thus, or in conclusion, we reach uh, this particular finding. First, second, finally are used, you know, so you start another paragraph. In second experiments we did, or finally we, we did this, or finally in the discussion with this, we, for example, there's another way of starting or connecting. For example, we did this because uh, to support the previous finding. However, in contrast, instead, this is used uh, much in the discussion, you know, in contrast with our findings, or in contrast with the first finding, we found this other one or instead. In addition, similarly, furthermore also, although this, despite this we found, nonetheless, we did other experiments to prove that. So I, we just provide you with that little chart for you to have um, and remember these transition phrases and words when you are writing one paragraph to the next. Um, so connect the ideas, transition examples, for example, another malaria example. Malaria infections have decreased. Malaria drug usage have decreased. Hospitalizations have decreased. The conclusion is bed nets are decreasing the incidence of malaria. Okay, that is kind of clear, right? We understand what happened but it's a little choppy, like a telegram, right? Malaria decrease, malaria decrease hospitalization decrease, but that's what I've been telling you to be clear and direct. But then we have to use connecting words. Um, so this sounds better. Malaria infections have decreased, suggesting that bed nets are impacting malaria transmission. Similarly, hospitalizations have decreased, lending additional support to this hypothesis. Furthermore, malaria drug usage has decreased that it seems likely that bed nets are effective. That's like a paragraph from a discussion proving that 
demonstrating that the use of bed nets have worked. But you don't just state it like this in the first paragraph, but you kind of uh, lead the reader to this suggest to us this. Similarly, other support the, the findings of the bed net for less hospitalization. Furthermore, it, um, the usage has decreased, so um, of drugs have decreased, so it seems a bed network. So that's another example for you to have and to use. And also connect uh, the phrases um, with a single word transition. So less clear will be during the, this is a laboratory, so I apologize. Uh, we increase, well, in this experiment, it doesn't matter what it is, we increase the cell concentration uh, and improve the method by increasing the cell concentration. And more specific will be that during this step, we, uh, we increase the cell concentration. As a result of the increased salt concentration, the recovery was better of the RNA. So see how it's repeated and it is clarified and it is a valid repetition of the word. As a result of the increased salt concentration, the recovery was better. So here it says we increase the salt concentration and the recovery improved, but it's kind of lost in the paragraph. And in here, you can find clearly um, what, what was that work in that particular method? What was the, the, the thing they did that actually is a kind of a finding because increasing salt were better. So um, sentences should be told short and to the point and the point should be obvious. Eliminate extra words. Well, as I was saying that we were taught to write the evidence is suggested that there's the possibility that these cells don't divide in culture. So this finding suggests that the cells did not divide in culture. Um, or we just say the cells did not divide in culture. And instead of saying the evidence suggests that there's a possibility that, or this finding suggests that the cells did not divide, we say the cells did not divide in culture. We go directly to that beginning and um, and instead of saying examination of the patients was carried out, we say the patients were examined. So we are taught to write in the past passive word and saying we don't, we were taught to say, we did this, I did this, this is my finding, this is our finding. Uh, so we just kind of go in a way around it. Exa examination of the patients was carried out or oh, for God's sake, no. We carry out the examination of the patients. And instead of explaining that the who we say the patients were examined and the findings were some so and so and so. So try to be direct and avoid uh, these introductions to uh, a fact. And we use columns and semicolons to our advantage. Good writing has three qualities brevity, clarity, and good structure. Um, Good writing has three qualities and we use semicolons, brevity, clarity, and good structure. So this allows us to be more clear and specify what the, the good writing three qualities are. So it gets clear and specific. And the omit, omit filler phases like it is, there is, there is clearly, that's a word that's not used because in science never is, is clear. We have demonstrated that there is drug resistant. Clearly, there is drug resistant. No, we just say, well, we, we just don't say clearly. We just don't say, obviously, we just don't say, um, you know, for sure this proves. No, we say this shows our data gave us these results. And it's not until the discussion we, we, we put uh, our opinions and it clearly is never so clear in science, the, our data. So it's a, it's a word that we don't suggest to use um, because it's clear to you, it might not clear to the reader. We're trying to present data that is, has to be proven. And, um, and other articles can come later and disprove what you did. So uh, we have to be cautious. Um, 
So this is just simple words that are preferred just for you to have looked at instead you could examine it prior to before because most use and give a reference at this um, at this point of time see this is a long sentence at this point of time we say now we you know did this and that and the other we found this and the other or now we're going to study such and such um, it has long been known that uh, in give a reference it's better to say what it was known so Let's say tuberculosis is the cause of death uh, of 8 million people in the world. Uh, and you give a reference. You don't start, it has been known that tuberculosis uh, is the main cause of disease. You just start talking about it and give a reference. Don't say it has been known if you don't have a reference. You cannot make general statements we have without supporting them. Each statement you make has to have a reference. I'll answer a few of these questions quickly. Um, one question is, some reviewers prohibit repetition. Is there a rule for this? I just talked about um, how, how it repeated. The, the important things are said, not just repeated over and over, but in sentences that make sense, like when I was explaining the paragraph structure. You don't repeat the whole thing, but you repeat certain key words. Um, can we include those who made financial contribution for the publication fee as one of the authors not recommended? Will you acknowledge at the end of the article, we're going to see on Thursday, uh, the financial contribution that it was made for this and you cite who contributed and what institution and which um, grant you received. This is acknowledged at the end of the article. It does not make a person an author in the general rules. Um, I have found many sentences longer because English is my second language. Do you have any tips to overcome this? Uh, yes, use the dot, continue, you know, the period. So, uh, I have found, we have found this period. This show that, that this and the other period. Therefore, we studied this this way, or therefore, this is our findings in table one. Just make shortened sentences uh, of what had been a, a long one. Um, another one's. It's always hard to know. Phrases are preferred to single word transition. Does it mean that there is no hard and fast rules concerning consistencies of science writing since the quoted comment comes across as an exception? Not quite understand. Um, there are no hard and fast rules concerning uh, how to write in science. These are just suggestions. That would be my answer to your question. Uh, you do not use exact words when you're uh, citing an author. You can say, this person found this particular thing and, and refer it. It's better you don't copy what the person, the author say. If you copy it, you have to put it in brackets. So you just make your own interpretation and say, this, this person found this and the other. And you do not repeat what the author said exactly. Uh, you just said this was found and you put the reference. Um, how much credibility does a student have by publishing by, by itself, I imagine? Do they get neglected um, and they are finding they are not publishing? Yeah, it is kind of true. If you publish with somebody that's very known in the field, as a last author, like the head of the department that's already published, that is um, preferred, unfortunately. Anonymous attendees, how to evaluate a sample size is relevant for a case study. You will have to talk to a statistician. This is important. 
Uh, we don't have time to cover statistics in this uh, general work introduction. Uh, this is a topic for a whole workshop. So we always suggest um, to have in your in your um, study somebody that knows how to do your statistical analysis and tell you if it's relevant or not. It is very important that um, you have the support from somebody that knows how to analyze data. Very important. So you consult with them. And if they do substantial work, they could even become an author. Or sometimes uh, we just have to pay somebody. And we sometimes, usually if we're writing a proposal, we have uh, a salary of compensation or honorary for the um, a st a statistical analysis or a person that can help us. Um, active work or passive voice, active voice or passive voice, which one is more preferred? Uh, active voice, try not to use passive voice. It takes more words and it, it doesn't make it as direct. Um, about author is how important is the author sequence? Um, oh my God. The author sequence, <laughs> It is done in amount of work that each person did. That's how it's understood. So the first author did most of the work. The person that did second to most of the work goes next, and then so on and so forth. Uh, the one that did least go towards the end. But usually, the head of the team goes at the end. So I work in the laboratory of Eva Harris in Berkeley. She always goes at the end of all the articles. <clears throat> she is the famous person and, and it's more likely to be published, but she also knows exactly what we're doing. It's not that she's not involved into all, all the work we do and she could defend the article. So um, <clears throat> that's the importance of the corresponding first author. Um, Let's see. We're gonna have um, the corresponding first author is the one that wrote and it puts their um, address. We're gonna talk about that next some few days, but in a few days, but the corresponding author could be also, if you're a student in the lab and you're gonna make a transition to another place, the corresponding author could be the head of the team of the head of the, the, the group, the research group we're dealing. Somebody is gonna stay in the institution that is gonna be responsible and that um, can defend the article and keep the correspondence, which is very important to keep the correspondence uh, up to date. Um, how to do another question, how to do detailed references. We're going to have Gregorio is going to teach us tomorrow how to write, um, how to have reference managers that is going to have, help us with each journal uh, has a different style of presenting references. 